Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, so my name is Matt Cicchini and I'm here with uh, uh, Sanjay Mukhopadhyay and we're going to be uh, talking today about the histology and pathology of the mediastinum to kind of give you a basic intro of some of the normal um, of what's going on. And so we first wanted to start with this kind of a very busy table but, and this diagram, but I think it's got a lot of great information here um, that we can really start to break up and build this differential of mediastinal lesions. And I think this is something that is really important and kind of comes up in multiple formats, um, either on board exams or in working up differentials or in clinical cases. Um, uh, so, Sandra, did you want to start talking about some of the maybe kind of how we break up these different components of yeah, the media? Like okay, let me take the anatomy part and you can take sure. the anatomy part. How's that? Sounds I great. I love the anatomy part. So, if you can just point at stuff as I talk about it, now. I got my pointer all ready to go. Yeah. So, the I, I mean, I learned a lot while reading about this, like a lot of really interesting anatomic stuff. So the one, let's start uh, with the junction of the sternal head with the body, that junction, yeah. So that junction where, you know, where the sternum, the head of the sternum meets the body is the maneuverous sternal uh, 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 joint. And at that joint, there is a plane and that plane is that black line that goes all the way back to the spine. And that plane is called the plane of Ludwig. Plane of Ludwig, which we yeah mentioned also in the table. That plane of Ludwig actually separates the superior mediastinum, which is the orange cone or triangle or whatever, from the inferior mediastinum. And the inferior mediastinum is what we typically divide into anterior, middle, and posterior. So I didn't know this before. I'm so embarrassed to, to, to uh, admit. But it's the in, not the mediastinum that's divided into anterior, middle, and posterior, but the inferior mediastinum. Mm -hmm. um, so in the... Inferior mediastinum, it's pretty easy if you keep the heart as a reference. Anything ahead of the heart is the anterior mediastinum, which is the blue. The heart and, and anything inside the pericardial sac and that middle region is the middle medi mediastinum. And then anything behind that is the posterior mediastinum. And nowadays, it's fashionable to call this, um, I think, prevascular. Is it prevascular, Matt, the first one? I think so. Vascular and postvascular, something, something along those lines. Yeah, I don't know. I, I still think in anterior, middle, and posterior. Yeah, me too. I'm old-fashioned like that. But yeah. people now, you know, use it as use a kind of different terminology, which means essentially yeah. the same thing. And and remember that the inferior border of all the inferior mediastinum is the diaphragm. So essentially, we're talking of in the when we talk of mediastinum, we're talking of all the structures that are between the two lungs. And then we're talking of um, things above and below. And the table, I think one of the really nice things that we've done in this table is shown both the boundaries and the normal structures that occur in that, um, in that compartment. So for example, I won't go through all of this, but for example, if you look at what happens in the uh, anterior mediastinum, it houses and cushions the thymus. So the thymus um, is partly in the anterior mediastinum and protects the heart. And so that, you know, it, this uh, table gives you a lot of information about, you know, the, just the normal counterparts before going to the tumors that occur there. Over to you, Matt. Well, perfect. Um, and so I, so I guess we can go through the differential now, I guess, um, for these different components. And so the anterior mediastinum, which I think is probably the most common um, place that we'll see lesions or specimens from or most commonly comes from the differentials. Um, so I was always taught to think of the T's, um, you know, and so the, I think that's a nice way of remembering it. So you have your thymoma, you have your thymic um, cysts, the lymphoma, it's kind of, they kind of get in there by calling it a so-called terrible lymphoma, or um, I, I don't know, I think that's a bit of a stretch, but it's a way of, I guess, remembering it. Um, and then you can also have thymic carcinomas, um, and then germ cell tumors, which can commonly be teratomas to keep with the T um, um, <laughs> um, mnemonic. Um, and then remember as well that you can also just have thymic hyperplasia, so it doesn't actually have to be a neoplasm. And then thyroid, so you can actually have uh, goiters that can extend all the way down into the mediastinum as well to give you a, a mediastinal lesion. And then uh, so another pseudo T is a parathyroid adenoma. So remember that you can get um, parathyroid tissue all over the place, including in the mediastinum. So that's also in your differential. So the differentials for the anterior mediastinum are there and largely in the T's that it, at least kind of you can push them into the T. 
um, the middle mediastinum, which is where we have the heart. Um, so uh, this is a smaller differential and the, we do have some benign cysts that are often pericardial. You can get metastases in this space. And then remember that you can get all kinds of abnormalities with the vasculature in this space. So you can get aneurysms and dissections, which could present as a middle mediastinal mass. The posterior mediastinum, so this is where we have a lot of our nerve structures, so you can get all these neurogenic tumors, including schwannomas, and as well, the esophagus is actually in this space as well, so remember that you can get esophageal malignancies arising in this space. And then last but not least, the superior mediastinum, which is on top, um, you can get many of the similar things as the anterior, so you can get thymomas and thymic cysts. You can also get lymphomas in the space and then often thyroid lesions, right, because this is um, the place that would be most commonly to get these mediastinal goiters extending down and as well as these parathyroid adenomas. Anything else you want to add with this? Uh, yeah, Sanjay? this is a great, great summary, man. I think that superior mediastinum, the way I think of it is like the intermediate zone between the neck and the chest. Yeah. So it kind of gets things from both ends, you know, like it gets neck lesions going down, chest lesions going up. Yeah. Uh, and so thymic lesions can also occur there. Uh, the posterior mediastinum, one thing I love to add, there's the Hattori cyst. Oh, yes, yes, that's a good thing. Do you <laughs> want to talk a little bit about that? Or? Yeah, the paravertebral mullerian cyst of Hattori. Yes. Described by, uh, I think his name was Hideo Hattori in chest in um, uh, 2005, I think. Just a beautiful Mullerian Paxate positive cysts, benign, beautiful. Yeah. They always occur in women yeah. um, next, to the next to the vertebral body. It's a beautiful benign diagnosis to make. Paxate is the great stain to do. That's also great. stains with ER. And the middle mediastinum, the one thing I would say is a paraganglioma would yes. be another thing to add. Yes, to that good. list. And of course, lymphomas pretty much can occur anywhere, yeah, yeah. but you know, because lymph nodes, you know, lymph nodes and everywhere, yeah. so lymphomas are everywhere. And these cysts turn out to be very uh, common everywhere. One really nice paper I read recently was by uh, Anya Rodin, mm. did a very nice paper from the ITMIC database where she looked at all the various, you know, how yeah. common are these things in the ITMIC database. So a lot of this data actually comes from that paper. Yeah, it's a more paper. updated version of what we already knew. Yeah, and I, I guess another important thing that I've seen is that it would be very uncommon to have a thymic lesion in the posterior mediastinum. Um, it, it, would you agree with that, Sanjay? Or? Very what, uh, Matt? Uncommon. uncommon to have a thymic lesion, like a thymoma or, a, you know, the, the, they're, they're really largely in the anterior. And I think if, yes. if, 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 if the lesion is clearly in the posterior, it would be uncommon to have uncommon. a thymoma. Yeah, thymic lesion there. I really think, like you said, for posterior, your first thought should be a neurogenic tumor of some yeah. kind. Schwannoma, ganglioneuroma, malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumor, yeah. Tarlov cysts, which are also yes. neuro. So those things would be posterior mediastinum. Yeah. Definitely. Okay, so clear that. And then let's move on to the next. Um, and then I thought we could, we, we talked about this in one of our other videos, but I thought we could talk a little bit more about the normal thymus um, that you would see. Um, and, yeah, and you then, want to give it a shot and then I'll add if you, if, if you. Uh, that sounds great. So um, I, I assume this is from a younger individual because the, the thymus is kind of peaks in size around puberty, which we'll show on the next slide. But here you can see that there's a very substantial amount of tissue that we have here. Um, and I really love this low power um, shot here, which shows these more blue areas here, and then these kind of lighter pink areas here. So this is the cortex and the medulla here, or, me or medullary areas, if you will, depending on, I think we're, there's still some debate on, on how we should say that. Um, and then here is kind of a medium power photo, which nicely highlights these more cortical blue areas here, and then these lighter staining medullary areas here. And then, I want to bring your attention here to this area here where you see this really pink area here and then we look at higher power we can actually see it's got this bit of this squamous type of differentiation to it so this is Hassel's corpuscle here which is a key feature in identifying thymic tissue here um, and this is just kind of highlighting more of these medullary areas here as well um, so this is, would be the normal structure that we would see in, in, a, in, a, in the thymus um, that has these nice architecture with the differentiation of these cortical and medullary areas. Um, is there anything you'd like to add to that, Sanjay? Or? No, that's great, Matt. I think um, one, uh, what I would add to that is in, in a practice that mostly deals with adult patients like mine, yeah. you know, like I don't yeah. see pediatric anything, uh, I rarely ever see this kind of a beautiful thymus. Yeah. 
you know, beautiful, juicy thymus with all the classic architecture. What most people will see in adults is atrophic thymus, which looks nothing like this. Yeah. So this is the, you know, the ideal, the, the childhood thymus, which then gradually involutes and all this yeah. epithelial stuff and lymphoid stuff starts to disappear. And what you're left with is mostly fat. Which I think is what we have here. Um, so, so this is actually uh, what you were, were talking about there, Sanjay, whereas we mostly have fat and some vessels here. And then this is the real remnant of this thymic tissue, which is really quite atrophic. Um, and this is just um, data um, showing um, the of thymic weights over time and showing that it does peak around the 11 to 16 age group. Um, and that's kind of the, the time where the, the thymus is peaks in weight and then will decrease in size um, over that. And so you expect in, in older individuals that they'll have kind of a smaller thymus. And this is, these tables are basically what's used for making a diagnosis of a thymic hyperplasia, right? And so yeah. if you fall beyond standard deviations of these means, then that yeah. will put you into the thymic hyperplasia for you. And can you tell that little story? Because I think that's a very interesting story of how you discovered this. So when we went looking for <laughs> the source, <laughs> what happened? Can you just, just, just correct the record here? Because in the previous one, we said we use the a AFIP mediastinal uh, fascicle for that. And then yeah. we, we looked at the references and what happened after that. So uh, we, we kind of went down a rabbit hole, actually. Um, so um, we, we, uh, we, we looked at the... Um, the FIP, and then they had cited the um, histology for pathologists, right? Is that right, Sanjay? Um, and then we we went there, and then they had um, cited some papers that we had difficulty finding. Um, and then so we actually went back and reviewed all the literature, and it really appears that weighing thymuses was really in vogue around 1920s, 1930s. Um, and so we went back and, and found and read these really, really old papers. And I think the study we ended up finding was a study that was actually started um, before World War I and where they were weighing all these thymuses um, in autopsy series in England. And then the study was put on hold because of the war. Um, and then the lead study author died. And then so they had to then, and this was all in their introduction of the paper, which was interesting. And you don't really see any more about the, the history of it. And then they, then someone else took on the study and completed it. And so but they, they actually weighed hundreds of these thymuses um, um, in all these studies. And it actually is the most comprehensive series of, of thymic weights um, per age group. And so that's where we got this. And I think it nicely shows conceptually what we know where we do see this peak here in at puberty that then declines over time. And so. Um, so what does the weight uh, become like? The, so it's about 20 grams or less, right? Yeah, uh, basically, yeah. So here's 20 across, right? And so or less. And then the peak weight is really about 35 grams. Yeah, I believe so. Um, it's yeah. somewhere around there. But at any there. point, if you have a 50 gram or more thymus, it's abnormal, correct? It, it cannot be normal if it's 50 or more. Of Basically, course, yeah. it's always complicated by the fact that there's fat there. Yeah. And you don't know if the fat is part of the thymus or not. But if you take away all that complication, if you just think of, I weighed it and it weighs 200 grams, it's got to be abnormal. Exactly. So it's not in the range of normal thymus anymore. Exactly right. For yeah. any age. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, so it's a great, great piece of investigative work. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we I, have immortalized I, it. It can get immortalized on YouTube. Your your sleuthing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, I, I I do enjoy reading those older papers. I, I think it's and even just like looking at their graphs and thinking of like like how they made those graphs in the 1920s and things, right? Like there's no Excel or computers, you know, and like you know, making all these lines and plotting everything by hand is is like something that we don't have to think about anymore, right? Yeah, but it's yeah. it's interesting. Um, so yeah, so I think that that's what we have here for the normal kind of thymus and kind of approach to that. And I think this pairs nicely with some of our other videos on the topic. Yeah. And so we encourage people to go watch those videos um, um, after. Great job, Matt. Thanks so much.